we're going to have conversations with two of my best friends from phase one. That's us. Uh-oh. Hold on. There's a cat in the room. Hi, everybody. It's Kevin Raber, and we're back for another Conversations with them. Today, we're having a conversation with two of my best friends from Phase One. Lau Norgard, who's the Chief Visionary Officer of Phase One, and Drew Aldolfer, uh, who I'll never get the name right, but he'll correct me if I'm wrong, and we'll put the spelling there for everybody, who is sure. the uh, Product Manager. And um, if any of you have remembered in the past, normally in the first quarter of the year, I get a personal visit from these guys for a few days, and things have changed. Absolutely. Times are different. Yeah. So today, uh, we'll be starting a number, part one of a number of conversations that uh, we'll have with Drew and Lal in regards to uh, phase one, and uh, we'll get some things rolling in regards to some of the cool gear they're working on and how we're all going to come out of this and do some cool stuff. So um, I'm going to start this kind of thing off is that, uh, first off, I don't know what's gone over on over in Denmark. Um, you guys are standing five feet uh, next to each other. Are you back in your offices? What happened? Oh, you, you got We're back you. in the office, but we have, we are following the, the World Health yeah, Organization guidelines, guidelines uh, keeping our distance. But uh, yeah, Denmark's been pretty fortunate in uh, they, they really put everyone under forced quarantine very early, um, kind of got a handle on it. I mean, I don't want to be presumptuous, but uh, yeah. things have been uh, moving steadily with uh, the ability to plan. So was it uh, a week ago? A week, and a, yeah, a week and a half ago, the youngest kids were back in school. So my son is back in school. My daughter is still working from home. Yeah. But we are slowly starting to open up again. Slowly. And, slowly. and part of that, that slowly uh, reopening is private businesses. Uh, like phase one, you have the option to go into work. Yeah. Uh, but of course, the, the company has to have uh, mm -hmm. some pretty strict guidelines. We've had to move desks around, move offices around. We have, uh, we have lots of hand sanitizer around. Uh, and uh, we gotta we gotta keep our distance. Yeah. So you know we can still get things done, uh, but uh, I gotta tell you the commute into work is just fantastic. Traffic is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know it's it's I think, I think about about getting things done. The other thing is that as we obviously don't travel, and Drew and I we normally travel quite a bit. Yeah, we actually get things done. <laughs> yeah, but it's been real boring. <laughs> there were other things that we were planning on getting done. Yeah. I've been avoiding that paperwork for months. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, now you're back in the office and you got to do it. Well, you're, you're a lot more fortunate. We are here in uh, the U.S. <clears throat> uh, personally, I've had one family member die of this uh, COVID and my wife has been sick with it for over a week and it's not something you want to be sick with. No, so, no, it's not something we take lightly uh, in no. Denmark. It's not any, something anyone should take lightly. And we, of course, uh, we wish there was something we could do to help Kevin. Uh, yeah. oh, she's just trucking through it. Luckily, so far, we've been lucky, but my heavens, I don't wish this on anybody after seeing what she's gone through. So this is serious, serious stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're locked down through May 15th, at least here in Indiana. Um, so I can't even get into the studio and gallery unless I sign my life away. And then it's only a, a limited amount of time I can spend there to pick things up or, you know, bring things out. So I can't make prints or do a lot of the things I normally do. So, uh, you know, that's changed. So what, with all this change has come a big change in, in photography, and the, the whole photography industry is going to change. Wedding photographers aren't shooting weddings. Landscape shooters aren't going out to shoot landscapes, and the commercial guys pretty much have had almost all their jobs canceled out. So, you know, we're going to come out of this kind of starting from scratch. So um, what, what's the plans for phase one coming out of this? What do you guys uh, see, and how is this going to work for, for phase one? We're a very fortunate company in that we're, we're very small, but we're also very diversified. Mm. Uh, so phase one is not just uh, these two cameras. It's also the cultural heritage division. It's also the industrial division. There's also Capture One software. So we've got uh, a lot of different projects, uh, and it's a small team doing all of it. Um, so, you know, diversifying the business has really helped us uh, weather this storm. Um, but of course, you know, like everyone else, we've had to tighten the belt. As we, we, for any business, I think this is a tough time. Yeah, absolutely. So, so after it is also for us, but I think as, as Drew said, we are fortunate enough to be, be doing several different things that are affected, affected in different ways. So, so um, we are being cautious and humble about, about it, but uh, also starting to be reasonably optimistic now. Yeah. And I mean, you know, Kevin, you're, you're, we, we make a professional camera system and the, the, the professional jobs mm. have, have really dried up uh, and that really did fall off a cliff. Yeah. Uh, so of course, you know, there's not a lot of people buying our camera system, but 
the time that we've had, we've been able to come to the office. We've been fortunate in that regard. We've been able to set up some remote demo sites. And uh, a lot of what the whole team is doing now uh, is remote training for uh, future customers, we hope, or existing customers. Um, there's a lot of Capture One work uh, that's been going on. I'm sure David Grover has been uh, in over his head in, uh, in webinars. Uh, and then there's just a lot of internal discussions, you know, uh, that we've been fortunate enough to have of, well, if we're not going to be out on the road, uh, you know, doing webinar or doing uh, uh, events, then let's talk about, you know, what it is we can do to optimize for when we, we do pull out of this thing. Yeah. I, I, I like to maintain my optimism and say this is kind of a second chance, a second chance for everyone. First off, it's a, a chance that all of us, you know, have battled this thing on a worldwide basis. Um, you know, so everybody's in it together. There's not like one country that's snuck on by and everybody's doing just fine. Um, you know, in some countries, they're just beginning to feel the pain of this sure. you know, kind of thing. But, you know, as we do begin to, to slip out and, and open it up, uh, the few photographers that I have talked to are pretty optimistic that, the companies, as they begin to open up, although they'll be thinking differently, like you say you guys are, um, there's going to be a lot of need for photography and marketing campaigns. And if clothing is going to be sold in a different way, the fashion photographers are probably going to get <clears throat> back up on, um, you know, a, a heavy on shooting so that they can be able to shoot the fashion work might be a different way of shooting so that you know, there's uh, a lot more photography in, in the stores and retail as well as pretty much online. Um, and, you know, I think the, uh, the car business is going to need photography big time to, to, you know, sell new products and new things. So everything that kind of got on hold, you know, is all of a sudden when things open up, I think are going to uh, see a, a very, uh, you know, kind of a, a splurge or a, a need that needs to be filled. And I, hopefully that's going to come sooner there's of course yeah. going to be a backlog that'll yeah, that'll absolutely. need to be caught up on. I think that's what's, what's most surprising uh, from our side with uh, with these two camera systems is that you know sales haven't just stopped, but of course the the sales that we are making are much more calculated sales. There's much more of a dialogue with the uh, the customer on the other end, um, with the XT in particular. You know this is a, a very specialized camera system, and so there's been people that have been really waiting since we launched it in September. And now they're at home. Uh, so they, they've, they've made the decision to, well, I'll buy it now. I'll learn how to use it uh, yeah. in my living room. So it, when it, It's a good, uh, good opportunity also as a photographer to focus on, on your skills and your development and uh, going uh, full in with a completely new camera system might not be what you, what some people want to do just before a big trip. If it's a, for example, landscape photography uh, camera. But now taking the time to to very make very nice detailed photographs of your backyard while you while you learn to use this camera. We actually have quite a few uh, approaches with uh, with uh, with that mindset that to make the best of this situation, I will I will uh, spend some of my time on uh, on my de skill development and and learn a new camera or learn new skills, learn new software tricks. So uh, so we also try because we don't travel so much. To make ourselves available to the community to yeah. a great extent, to to have more uh, also online interactive, uh, and that's that's been part of the the fun part of this terrible situation that yes. that we're in is almost as as countries would uh, start to force quarantine and lock down, those photographers would all of a sudden be emailing me or calling me or texting me and suggesting, hey have you thought about doing this or this or this yes. with uh, this camera system? Have you thought about doing this? How do I do this more effectively? So there's really been this uh, turning inwards, uh, it seems, of photographers that you know, keeping their skills sharp and uh, really, you know, thinking about what they're going to do with this uh, camera systems once everything goes back to normal. We love to travel and meet photographers, mm -hmm. um, of course, to talk about our cameras, but also to talk about photography in, in general, um, just as we do when we, uh, with our annual visit to you, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, but this situation has also actually in a strange way, enabled us to meet more photographers in some ways. Right. Because suddenly we are not limited to traveling to one place at a time. So we can engage in, in more kinds of conversations with, with more people. They, of course, not face to face, but, but they can be, be more broad in, uh, in some ways, I think. Um, 
I still don't so have we, an excuse as to why I haven't done my expense report yet. I mean, that's oh, weird. Do you still also, suffer with that? Yeah, also learning new, new, new ways of, uh, of talking to people. The adage that everyone keeps kicking around and we're all in this together, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it does make you feel good when all of a sudden you're getting a call from a complete stranger from mm. Italy uh, who's hit so hard by this. And they just want to talk about cameras, talk about photography, talk about whatever. Yeah. Talk about anything to, to not talk about what we're talking about now. Well, it's, it's something I found in, in what I've been doing, and you haven't seen a lot of them yet because they're in the can and will start being published starting today, is I've been doing a lot of conversations with photographers, um, really cool photographers, um, some phase one users. Um, on, you know, what are you doing right now? What, do you have, what have you done during this, this time? Uh, what have you done to improve your skills? What do you plan to do? Uh, of course, a lot of people say they're going back to do, uh, you know, all their looking at all their old images and working on different things along those lines. For me personally, um, I've gone back in and on your advice, Drew, I've made catalogs now um, in several ways. So I take each year's yeah. worth of sessions and now I've uh, made catalogs uh, on those so that I can uh, work as a whole instead of the, the pieces, meaning uh, right. the, the sessions are always great in Capture One. I work really well with those, but now I can bring all the sessions together. So every year uh, has been cataloged now and then every major event. So uh, trips to Antarctica and Greenland and Svalbard and Iceland, they all now have their own catalogs too. So while those images may be in catalogs 2016, 17, and 18, I also have one combined set of images in a catalog that I've never had before. Uh, so I've used the time to you know, to kind of consolidate and bring together all my images. And the nice thing about the catalog so far is that- How much wine have you drank? Uh, I've got a fast- <laughs> We won't even get into the drinking part. I'm trying to stay sober with, with the coffee this morning and everything, you know? So, but um, it's, been a, it's been a heck of a project, and, but it, it's, it's like, wow, I've actually got some of this stuff to, to, to you know, put together now as I want to start working on some books on Antarctica and- uh, you know, some of these regions that I've been on and, you know, there'll be my little self-published books if I can find and scrape together another hour a day to do a project. Um, I know where to find those images easily. So uh, that's one of the things I've done. Plus I've gone in and, and sat in on a number of the tutorials as much as I think I know Capture One. Uh, David uh, Grover does a fabulous job. He you know, really knows Capture One. <laughs> yes. And, and, you know, there's some cool things coming. You guys are obviously going to be adding new features to Capture One soon. Um, I've kind of been, you know, privy to a few of them. But, you know, it's nice to see the direction that, that Capture One is going. And uh, tell me a little bit about things. Capture One and, and, and the Phase One hardware side, you guys have kind of moved the, the, away a little bit. And we'll talk more about that in another episode. But, you know, it's kind of two different things. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it used to be like one pool of R&D engineers uh, specializing in software, firmware, hardware that kind of all sat together. The software company, uh, you know, that business has grown so much that we've moved them to the other side of the building. Uh, they've been hiring like crazy. They're, they're scaling like crazy. Um, we've grown a bit, uh, but, uh, you know, it's still the same core people uh, in R&D at phase one developing the, the hardware. And of course, you know, we're still, we have to walk across the hall to, to talk to them. But what we've, the business as a whole has really done is, is focused on what Capture One needed. And what it needed was a lot more employees and a, a lot more yes. dedication. Well, it's, I can't wait. If, I hope somewhere along the line there's a, a Capture One app. You guys are way behind the ball on that one. And boy, won't that be nice when that happens? Because, you know. Maybe. Yep, maybe. <laughs> But I've got my iPads, you know, I, I'm, I use iPads and I'll be doing a, a couple articles on, you know, how important the iPad is to the photographer. Um, and Just get a really, Microsoft I, Surface Pro, install Capture One 20 on it, and you're all set. Okay. Windows will be never something that comes into this house. <laughs> We're going to be focusing with you guys just on the hardware side of things. And um, Capture One will approach in a different direction, hopefully. In the, it's where, the, where Lau and I are best poised. Yeah. Yeah, you know, actually, I'm going to be doing two um, Capture One uh, video capture screen capture tutorials myself. Okay. One is on importing because I have yet to see one uh, person that is imported properly. You know, they forget to set destination or they do a bunch of crazy things and want to know why their images aren't in their capture folders and stuff like that. And nice. then I'm going to touch my favorite spot and that's workspaces because, my God, somebody's going to get Kevin Raver workspaces if it's the last thing I do. One day. <laughs> you, 
you just don't like my workspaces, but believe me, there's people oh, that give them to But that's the beauty of a workspace, is it works for you. Yeah. Well, I'll name one after you, or if you want to share one sometime, you know, feel free to, you know, put your I'll, workspace. Up. I'll send them over, but you got to use them on a, on a Windows machine. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, let's talk a little bit about hardware. Um, sure. So that we're going to be coming back and doing uh, more serious in-depth on the hardware and uh, the user interface of uh, the camera backs, which I think is something that really deserves some attention. And so, you know, we'll be set up where we can share the screens. But uh, let's talk about the two different camera systems you have and what's the difference between those two camera systems and, you know, a couple of the features of those kind of systems. And I'll jump in where I can, but leave this one sort of in your bailiwick. So okay. uh, let's get started well, with that kind of we can We can start by, can you take that back off? We can start by what's similar. Um, if we, you know, break down the two camera systems, the XF and the XT, the one thing that they have in common is the, the IQ4. Yep. Um, so these are both IQ4 150s. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, interchangeable. Do you want me to I just spray that down for you? There you go. <laughs> They're interchangeable, right? I mean, you can, you can knock one IQ4 from one camera system to the, to the next. Uh, no big deal. So that's, if you start at where they're similar, yeah. that, the brains of the camera system, the IQ4, the exact same between the two, but you want to you tackle that one? Yeah, I think maybe the next step would be talk about how they're different. Because uh, with the luxury of having two camera systems, and developing two camera systems in-house, um, we can deliberately make them different and make them not do the same things. That's kind of the point of having two camera systems. Um, and the, uh, the XF camera system, especially now with, with adding the XT, the XF camera system, we can focus that on where that really shines, which is studio, elaborate, um, detailed uh, photography. It's a workhorse. It's for still life, for beauty, for uh, portraiture, for automobiles, for yeah, we would architecture, for all kinds of things where you typically, it, it's focused on tethering, on on configurability on remote control, all of those kind of workflow, workhorse um, we specialties. Wouldn't, we wouldn't stop anybody from buying the XF that wants to buy the XF. Everyone's willing yes. to buy it. But we design it for uh, the professional photographer, yes. you know, the, the, the photographer that's in their studio day in and day out, uh, setting Absolutely. up still life or doing fashion photography, or you know, they have one central location, their studio, that's their office. That's what mm. they work out of. That's did, what that camera's designed for. We designed it also with, uh, as we've talked about before, with no labels on the buttons because they can be reconfigured. So once you start reconfiguring, if it had labels, the labels would be wrong anyway. <laughs> it doesn't have any locking dials. It doesn't have a dial that can be set to uh, AV mode. Mm -hmm. Because once you start to remote control it from Capture One, any locking dials would require you to go mm -hmm. and charge the camera. So everything is configurable. Everything is remote controllable. So in that way, it's, it's part of a, a system. And everything is controlled through that IQ4. Yeah. Where the, uh, the XT camera, we deliberately designed that to be something else. And it's something for one specific type of photographer, mm. right? So if the XF is for anybody under the sun that wants that, that level of a professional dedicated camera system, the XT, we've... Of course, we're not going to stop anybody else from buying it. Whoever wants to buy it is welcome to buy it. Mm -hmm. But we've designed it for the landscape photographer. Yeah. I mean, the person that's out in the field, it is a field camera. It has uh, movements that uh, move the back. Uh, it's manual focus. It's precision, large format, medium format optics from uh, Rodenstock. Yeah. It has our shutter that we've designed to work with uh, these types of lenses. Uh, it's, it's dead simple. Yeah. It's, it, it's meant for one thing and to do that one thing perfectly. On the XT, um, it's more of a manual camera. You, have, you said you can do a couple adjustments, swings, tilts, or just rise? Just, uh, just shift. Just shift. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mix and line. How many lenses do you have available for that camera? Uh, as of tomorrow, because tomorrow is May 1st, we'll have uh, four. So we announced uh, three new lenses and uh, next month we'll be able to start shipping the 50 mil. So we've got a 23, 32, 50, and 70. So that's kind of a typical landscape um, yeah, uh, yeah, shooter's exactly. package. Are, are you going to be adding one longer lens by any chance? 
Yeah, we, uh, we're going to have a 90 later in the year. The exact date, I don't know. Uh, and then we've got a few options on the table for something uh, more telephoto, something uh, above 100 uh, mil. Mm -hmm. But there's a few options from Rodenstock that are on the table that we are playing with to figure out which one we're going to yeah. move forward on. Cool. So and this doesn't have your typical having to cock the shutter. That's all done automatically in a sense, correct? And, and that's kind of the, the, you know, the, the thing that makes this camera system possible. Yeah. Is, I think what you're hinting at there, Kevin, is uh, in many ways it looks like any of the traditional technical cameras right. that, that uh, mm -hmm. many landscape photographers have been using for, for many years. Uh, and with digital, they were able to make fantastic image quality, but was somewhat of uh, an acquired, uh, they, had, they had a learning curve to them. Sure. With cocking the shutter, opening the shutter, these uh, sync cables and all of that. And what we've done essentially is... Uh, built our shutter um, that we've designed and uh, purpose uh, engineered for our industrial systems. So mm -hmm. the thing doesn't break. It, it's it's last to, it, it's designed to work in vibrating aircrafts that shoot every 0.5 seconds day after day. We, we built that shutter into a package that essentially fits in all the existing lenses. It's a almost a drop-in replacement for the Copal shutter. Because as we all know, Copal doesn't exist it, anymore and yeah. there's no more inventory. So with that shutter put into these, these lenses, um, and with, uh, with our uh, connectivity implemented inside the lens, we now have a lens mount here that mounts to the camera body. That, um, that mounts to the digital back. And essentially provides end-to-end -end integration, turning, it, turning these fantastic technical lenses and the IQ fallback into one completely integrated camera system. It's just a camera with a capture button. You can say that's so casual, just a camera. Yep. But it's the same lens that, uh, you know, this is the 32. This has been around for, what, 12 years, 10 years, something like that from Rodenstock? Yeah. But it's the same one that you've been able to find uh, a long time ago. It's just well, that one, a couple shutter, and you had to have a cable to the digital back, and it, it worked, sure. Yeah, so we, we essentially designed it around marrying the best sensor, the 150 megapixel backside illuminated Sony sensor. Say that five times fast. In the IQ4 digital back. That part we had, we designed that for the image quality and the flexibility. And we wanted to marry that with the best available lenses in the smallest and lightest package. Mm -hmm. That essentially is what we built. Mm -hmm. so, so this camera is all about bringing the best sensor and the best lenses into the field. This camera here has the same logic. This is about bringing the, the best sensor possible with the best lenses, our uh, blue ring lenses. Uh, into the studio with a flexible, configurable workhorse. Yeah. And those lenses on the uh, XF, the Schneider lenses, those are designed to be fast lenses. You know, we yeah. try and, you know, F, F2.8 is uh, where we start and we try and aim for as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Whereas these Rodenstocks, if we wanted 2.8, well, the design doesn't exist, so it would be a longer wait period to design it, but also the lens would get much, much bigger. Yeah. And, you know, these are proven. They've been around forever for uh, landscape photographers. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. What we need to do is go partner up with the, the best people in the business for that application. The best lenses. And if we, had, if we had put these lenses in this camera, that wouldn't have worked because these lens designs, they are not large aperture. Right. Because they don't have to be for landscape work. It'd be slow. Um, for landscape work, if you, if you bring a large aperture lens, your backpack is too heavy. Uh, there's, there's no reason to carry a large aperture lens if you don't intend to shoot a large aperture. Uh, you would actually make the wrong lens design compromises. So there you'd rather have a smaller aperture lens that's lighter and sharper. That's one set of compromises. Lens designs for a camera that's also used for beauty shots. You really want a mm -hmm. big aperture, which, which um, calls for a different set of compromises. So that's why having two distinct different camera systems essentially enables us to optimize them independently for what they're best at. Do you have a kit made up for the um, for a landscape photographer? I mean, most of the people we deal with are landscape shooters. I really love the technical cameras. At one time, I had a complete Alpha system with six lenses, and mm -hmm. a 23 millimeter lens was probably my favorite. Um, uh, it required a deft hand in the sense of uh, handling the... Um, uh, color corrections and a lot of the other things that went with it and but boy it was such a good lens the 32 just uh, to me is probably the, the main lens yeah and I mean that's our primary kit I mean this yeah. this camera kit uh, is is primarily what what we sell with the XT the yeah. 32 
the XD body and the IQ4150. You mentioned the, the color corrections also. Um, and, uh, and I think whenever we're able to travel again, yeah. we bring some XTs, Kevin, and, and we will show you what has happened since. We'll That'd be cool. Because, uh, because that whole workflow of needing to do those color correction shots, that has been very, very significantly simplified. Yeah, we should just do one of these talks just talking about that. Absolutely. That makes okay, sense. Well, that, that. That, that would be good. Right, it's um, I know I fought with that for a long time and built up libraries of LCCs and all sorts of things um, along the way. But um, yeah, I, I, that camera has a lot of interest to me just because maybe I'm old school still, you know, and um, that's the way I like it. But with, well, it, with, is, it is a camera system that, you know, it, it's not doing much thinking for you. No. You no, know, this is a camera system that you, you are the operator for yeah. sure. You are the, the craftsman that's using that camera system. And that's one of the examples of, uh, of the kinds of tools that we designed the XF camera to do well. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, controllable. It can be automated. We can build those kinds of features into the XF because they are extremely useful. Of course, in the studio, something like focus tagging is also actually quite useful um, for landscape. Um, but let's do that. Let's make a, another uh, episode about want. that. Yes. We got loads of time. And look at so what, what, are the other, what other features are in focus stacking? Last time we talked, you said there was um, built for the future, I believe, if I'm kind of paraphrasing here. Yeah. Um, and you did just recently announce a new feature for that, uh, Cameron. Yeah. And so that's what we built into the IQ4. So it's not uh, dependent on the XT or the XF. Okay. But if we develop features for the IQ4 for the Infinity platform, uh, then they apply to anyone using the XT or the XF. That focus stacking that we talked about, that's an XF specific feature. So okay. we've got different places where we can build different features. Um, so what you're referencing, the, uh, the Infinity platform update that we spoke about last time we saw you, and the one that we just released is, uh, is kind of this one. This yeah. is the, uh, the dual exposure plus feature. It's, it's in a, a beta mode, a work in progress mode uh, of the uh, IQ4. But basically what we're doing in a nutshell is a single capture gives you 15 stops of dynamic range. We've made it so it's, uh, it does two captures simultaneously um, and gives you 18 stops of dynamic range. That's what dual exposure plus is. So it's like bracketing without the hassle. So is that combined in capture one to it, it kind of as a, a two exposure HDR or what? It's well, so combined in the back in the IQ4. Yeah, so the, the, yeah. the back creates one raw file. Okay. That is then processed into capture one. So when you open the capture one, it's just, it's just one file. But once you start uh, lightening the shadows, bringing up the shadows, you see a very significant quality difference. And maybe Drew can uh, illustrate that. I'm doing my best. So essentially, these two shots, uh, the, the... This one is a normal exposure, which gives us 15 stops of dynamic range. And mm -hmm. this one is using dual exposure plus, which is, uh, it's using the electronic shutter. So it takes one capture uh, at the exposure you choose, but then immediately behind it, before the first capture even finishes, it's already exposing one that's three stops under. Yeah. So as the data reads off, it all gets put into the same pool. It all gets read off and combined into one raw file. So you get a raw file that you couldn't tell the difference just by at a glance, which one is using dual exposure plus and which one is using uh, normal exposure. And are these two, uh, as they come out of the camera, have you done any processing to them? I just, uh, I just brought up the... Uh... Okay, so you, you, uh, you exposed for the highlights and made sure that the, the cloud didn't clip, or since you're shooting straight into the sun here. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Someone just hiding behind a chimney. Which means that if we want to see what was in that uh, doorway there or in, in the window. Right. So if I bring up the shadows a ridiculous amount, uh, then the, the normal exposure, I'm going to bring up with it all that noise that I can. Yeah. But then on the dual exposure plus capture, uh, I bring it up the exact same amount, but that noise doesn't exist. Maybe zoom in a bit more because I don't know in the in, uh, video format here how, how it looks. We'll send you the files, Kevin. Yes. You can play with them. Yeah, we'll, we'll drop them in as B-roll if we have to. Yep. But as you can see here, this is what we would expect. Yeah. Such a, even at a base ISO of 50. Yeah. Let's, let me be clear. This isn't bad. This is great. This, this, yeah. is, this is fantastic. It's also with all noise processing turned off. Yeah. So, so this is what we would expect from a deep, deep shadow pulled up as much as we can do in Capture mm -hmm. One. 
So the deep shadow essentially is very, very underexposed. And once we bring it out, up, it's like taking a very underexposed image and then correcting that. That will, by the laws of physics and math, be noisy. It sounded, sounded like a nice, by the laws of <laughs> physics. <laughs> what we have over here is <laughs> two exposure plus, as Drew just explained. It mm. does the first uh, um, kind of metered exposure, mm. the one for the highlights. Then it does a second exposure immediately on top of that that is much longer, where right? it's kind of exposing for the shadow areas. And when those are combined, when we start pulling up a shadow, it essentially takes the data from that second exposure. So uh, this is, of course, expanding dynamic range, but it's not just expanding dynamic range. It makes sure that all areas, all pixels, essentially, comes from a well-exposed image. Yeah. And then you don't, because of the way that it integrates it and because of the way that it reads it off the, the sensor of the IQ4150, it's so fast that you don't get you know, these are two separate images that are stacked on top of each other. You get one seamless image. So, so like if the leaves were blowing or anything like that, would that be noticed at all in the landscape shot or? Well, it, I mean, if the, so if the leaves were right in front of the camera and they were moving like crazy, then you would see it. But, you know, I've got leaves in the background and you're not going to see any yeah. difference. And then if you look at a real world application, you know, the detail in the grass, when I pull it up, the noise and the fine detail of the grass starts to get muddy. Uh, but when I look at the dual exposure one, I've still got density, I've still got contrast, I've still got all that, that beautiful quality. Pretty and cool. I do have another image of water, so as to satisfy your curiosity. Not that one. This one. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. And just maybe show the on, on uh, it is a version first, where you can see how deep a shadow that really is. Yep. This again, exposing for the highlights, and then pulling up those deep, deep shadows there. So exposure for the highlights, this is just dead black. Yeah. Uh, and then if I was gonna pull all that up, I would get noise. But if I pull up this one, oh, this is the one with noise. So then if we compare that to, this is the normal shot. So uh, normal exposure brought up all the shadows, and this is the dual exposure one. So that's how clean it is because you know I'm not, there's no noise to bring up when I pull up the shadows because we've combined it from that uh, yeah. that different exposure. And I mean, just if you look at the number seventy four, how craggly that is from all the noise. Yeah, look at look, that. So, you know, this mm. window reflection, you can see all that chroma noise, all that structured lumen noise, but it's crystal clear in the other one. Yeah. How ISO dependent is this new feature? Meaning. You know, designed to shoot at a low, or can you use the higher ISOs and still see the same kind of benefits? You, you see more benefits. You know, I really have to push these files at base ISO uh, mm -hmm. to see the benefits. But at uh, ISO 100, 200, 400, 800, it's much, obvious, much more obvious when you uh, take a look. To answer your question about water, Kevin, this is the shot with dual exposure plus, and this is the shot without. So there's no, you know, weird artifacts. No. You, I mean, you can find a scenario where it'll happen. You know, if, if uh, you know, somebody drives in front of you, like a race car drives in front of you, yeah, yeah. you'll see it. But for, for practical landscape use, it's, you will see very minimal issues. Yeah. A very I mean, nice feature to have. With that, with that buoy, that's something that is moving uh, in the water, with the water. You can see the noise in that, and then you can see how clean it is here, and there is no... Uh, overlap, no weird mm. artifact. Cool. Well, that's a and great that's new feature. A, um, example of something, if you did a HDR stitch of two images, that's where you'd have to make a very blanket choice: which image is it going to be? Because it can't be both, because no. they won't match. Yeah. So, but 18 stops dynamic range. I mean, holy cow! And be able to just use the software to be able to pull it without having to do an HDR and so forth. That's very. Yeah, and cool. that's the thing. I mean, the the software doesn't see doesn't treat them any differently. It's just the tools all of a sudden have more flexibility, it seems. Yep. If I go to 100 for the shadow recovery on a normal exposure, I bring all this noise with it. If I go to 100 on a dual exposure, I'm maxed out at 100 and there is no noise. Yeah. Very cool. Now, there's a couple other features in that camera. Let's just review them real quick and then uh, uh, we'll come back to those in the future episodes. Let's talk about focus stacking. So, um, yep. focus stacking, you know, when Drew and I did it a year or two ago, is pretty cool. How many, how many images can you stack or set the camera as far as the sequence goes and distance-wise, too? 
your your storage is the the travel of the lens is your limit. Yeah, we can move in such minute steps uh, that like a 120 macro, you can have thousands of images that the camera will automatically. And what we did is that, that a, a while ago we uh, first we we added focus tagging to the camera uh, in the first iteration of that feature. Later on, we expanded it with uh, the functionality to automatically calculate the number of stops you needed from your far focus to your near focus. Uh, and when we launched that, many of, uh, of our users were quite surprised about the number that you were uh, suggested to use, especially as Bruce said for, for uh, close up macro work, where many photographers would traditionally do maybe 10 frames would be enough for a certain uh, object. Like a ring or yeah. something, jewelry or something. But jewelry, right. watches, that, that kind of uh, photography. But, uh, but when you actually look at it, look at, at uh, the optical uh, engineering part of it and, and do the calculations, you might end up having to do 280 images or 120, however, to, to get that uh, complete front to back focus. And when you actually do the correct number of, uh, of images, the, the focus stacking software performs much better. If you have too few images that are kind of sharpness dips between them and mm -hmm. struggles to, to put it uh, together correctly. Does uh, Capture One do the stacking or is that done in a third party software? Capture One sees uh, all the images in a stack as a stack. They are right. tagged in the camera and saved with, with uh, sequence numbers to, uh, to make sure that you can find them all and, and process them out with the same settings and so on. And then we have a, a round trip uh, tool where you uh, you use Helicon Focus to do the actual stacking. So is, are you so selling Helicon Focus or it's just uh, you know export to and then back in kind of thing? We we partner with uh, Helicon Focus. So uh, anybody that owns a phase one camera system gets a free year subscription. But there's a round trip in, in Capture One that when we partnered with them, we built this round trip into Capture One. So oh, very cool. One you just say, uh, open edit with Helicon Focus and Helicon Focus automatically takes the images, puts them in Helicon Focus, opens them, then you choose your blending mode and then puts it back into Capture One. Yeah. Oh, pretty it's slick, good. Yeah, well, we, we definitely need to play with that one. Any other tricks in there that uh, I need to know about or we want to, you know, frame averaging? Yes, frame averaging. Okay. Frame averaging is kind of the, the cousin of Dual Exposure Plus. Mm -hmm. In Dual Exposure Plus, as we just explained, we are combining a short and a long exposure mm -hmm. to make one image. In frame averaging, we combine a number of short exposures or a number of, of identical exposures. Um, one of the challenges with dynamic range um, is that a pixel can hold a certain number of electrons. Once it sees more light than that, it will kind of overflow. It will be saturated. It will do clipping. So that's the limit to how much we can, how much light we can capture. Um, Dual exposure plus solve the other problem of kept, of uh, working in less light. The frame averaging, we want to address more light. Uh, and what we do there is that we do one short exposure. We read it out. We put it into memory. Then we do another short exposure. We read it out. We put it into, we add it to the first one in memory. And we keep on reading out of the sensor and adding up in memory so that the sensor itself will never overexpose. <laughs> kind of in a, in a virtual way, we do a long exposure. But we do it by doing little short exposures that individually never be, ne they never clip, they ne never, they're never overexposed. And because of the speed of the system, it's happening back to back to back to back. So there's, there's very little gap. Yeah. So if you did a frame average of, say, 10, 10 frames at a high ISO, and you put them together, you would start to see, here's one frame, here's the other frame, here's the other frame. You could see the outline of the individual frame. But you know, 10 frames at a 500th of a second doesn't take long to complete. Well, yeah. why don't you just do 100 frames, 200 frames, 500 frames, and so, now all of a sudden everything blends together. So essentially, what this gives us is the ability to do long exposures in daylight with no ND filters. Huh. Because we dial in, we, we put the camera on a tripod, we dial in the composition and the focus, uh, of course with live view, and then we shoot some images, we, we, we make sure that this is the image I want. Exposure-wise, composition-wise, focusing-wise, I make the image I want, but I want to have that blurry, silky water look or the, the smooth skies. Or I want to eliminate people. Or, yeah, I want to blur out the people. Then I open the frame mapping tool. And, and in that tool, I start out with the, with the parameters I just picked. And I just tell the camera, 
I want five minutes of this. And so it just, it, just, it just keeps on doing that single short exposure on maybe 125th of a second or a third of a second or whatever was your correct exposure. And it just does that back to back to back to back to back for your five minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour. And it adds up tens or hundreds or thousands of images into one combined raw file that then looks time-wise as the long one, but exposure-wise as the short one. So oh, very no, interesting. So this is all done in the back. You know, you're not doing it in, in the back. So it's, is it, you know, you must have good memory in the back to be able to do that or some sort of routine. Oh, yeah. that, cool. That's what we built the infinity platform for. <laughs> but yeah. if you look at these images, Kevin, this is kind of a, a sample of each. This is a normal exposure. This is a frame averaged exposure for two and a half minutes at uh, eighth of a second. Uh, and then this is the dual exposure. So essentially dual exposure is two exposures that are seamlessly uh, combined. So you can see that there is definitive outline of the fan that's yep. moving, of the people that are there, uh, because it's one eighth of a second and then what would it be? One third, one uh, and a half second exposure. Mm. That'd be two something, whatever. Uh, but it's short enough that it can blend everything together and you don't see any, any errors. Um, then if you look at the uh, dual exposure, this is an eighth of a second, sorry, frame average, an eighth of a second for two and a half minutes. You can see the fan's been moving. You can see these people are kind of muddy and blended. But look at the noise that exists in the fan or in the umbrella. Mm, uh -huh. Because this is the single capture. Noise reduction turned all the way down, ISO 50, crank up all those shadows. This is the normal exposure. This is the noise that would exist in there at 15 stops of dynamic range. This is the exact same exposure, but all that noise is averaged, right? And we yep. throw out the bad stuff. Uh, and then this is the dual exposure at 18 stops of dynamic range, where we can really pull up the shadows and we don't see any of that noise. Excellent. So kind of like doing a black cow, but you're doing it with multiple exposures. I mean, same sort of philosophy, right? Yeah. yeah so, so what we get with, uh, with uh, the, you could say the, the application difference for dual exposure plus and frame averaging is dual exposure plus gives you clean shadows as quickly as possible. Frame averaging gives you the ability to do long exposures in daylight and also gives you potentially extremely low noise if you have all the time in the world. Mm -hmm. And of course, with noise reduction and a few other tools, that will even look better. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm forcing it to look bad. <laughs> but you know, you can you can this image the exposure time is right on the edge, right? Would I use frame averaging or would I use dual exposure? Do I want the the subjects, the people in there, to be frozen or do I want them to be a blur? Mm. So you can get uh, very good benefits using dual uh, frame averaging, nice, silky, smooth, really low noise, uh, or you can use dual exposure and you can freeze everybody and get the same mm. benefits of that low noise. Excellent. Do you have any water shot examples? Mm. No. Okay. We'll, we'll come back uh, Let's do a different, different, different one on, the, on, on these tools because I think uh, both of them deserves a bit more digging into um, and uh, some examples of uh, what they could be used for. Cool. Well, you know, we could do, we could do a lot more. I, I want to explore both of these cameras a little more in detail. And um, I promise you guys, when you come out to visit, I've got a couple cool places. Maybe we won't go to Indianapolis. We'll meet somewhere else where we can go out and do some you know, yeah, real photography and put this thing to the test. Then we can go to Elmo's for dinner. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, let's, I'm sure they'll have social distancing there and everything, but yeah, if, you know, I know that's your favorite spot. And we'll, so you can stay here in Indy for a night and we'll, we'll, we'll go to that steakhouse. Okay, okay deal. And um, then, then we'll head out. But there's, it would be fun to, to, to shoot with both of those cameras, you know. Sure. Yes. Uh, it, there's some really cool technology that you know, nobody else is kind of really doing there. Having shot a lot of medium format in my day, because I'm not going to hide the fact that uh, I had a 13-year career at, at Phase 1, um, I became very accustomed to image quality, both as far as the file goes and, of course, more than anything else, you know, going out to the print. And I'm very big on printing, and that's a whole other uh, segment, uh, which we've already started with one episode with Dano and the new printers that Epson's releasing. And uh, of course, when we can get back together with them, we've got a big episode where four or five of us are going to be going very deep into fine art printing and uh, papers and inks and the whole 10 yards and a really cool program that actually cuts the images out of a piece of paper called Cut It Out by Image Print. 
the point being is that uh, you know photography's just you know gone off in 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 huge directions and you know quality is uh, of the utmost uh, to me so there is nothing like a phase one file when you open it up and with these new features with an 18 stop dynamic range i'd love to get my hands on one of those files and try printing it because for me when i complete my photography it's completing it as a print and you guys have been with me we've taken phase one files and we've made prints while you've been in the studio and you know you have to admit when you can photograph a concert hall and on your computer you can see that it's sharp but on the print you can actually look at the spotlights in the ceiling and see where the on off switch is and read it right um, it becomes very evident that you know a print resolution is so much better than a screen resolution and that's truly uh, when the the quality of these files really shines and um, you know and why it's so much different than some of the 35 millimeter solutions and other solutions that are out there you know and everybody thinks well I got a hundred megapixel file I can do a whole lot with it and, yeah hundred megapixels is a lot to work with but it's the quality of those pixels uh, in the end and the quality of the file and the dynamic range of the file that allows you to take it even further and you know that's the differential that I think phase one has always had and why I always love opening up a phase one file and being surprised. It almost reminds me of the day I made my first print with a friend in his dad's dark room and why I got into photography is, you know, what we used to count as magic, you know, as we watched a print develop in a tray, you know, we now look at magic as the quality of the file and what we can find in that file that we didn't know was there when we shot the image. Yeah. And, you know, that that's what I like about phase one that's why i believe in the product and um i still find those surprises so anyway drew and uh, lao uh, we will be back to do more together good looking forward to it and it's nice that we're at least coming somewhat <laughs> out of isolation um uh, we got a long way to go i think and uh, this has been a tough battle for the whole world yeah. you know um, as an idealist and a dreamer it's a time that the whole world should be working closer together, not only to solve the problem, but realize that, you know, we have a common enemy and, and we're not, and shouldn't be fighting each other. We should be fighting this one enemy that's, you know, more devastating than anything else that could happen. We should work closer together metaphorically, though. <laughs> we need to keep a safe distance. Yeah. So anyway, thank you guys for the time today. Uh, we will be back in a week or two with uh, part two and, uh, That'll be really good. And I appreciate it. So to all my viewers and readers, thanks for being with me. If you like the YouTube video, please click the subscribe button. That will help us. The little bell button is over there if you want to just kind of uh, uh, be notified when we launch more of these things. And, you know, I appreciate everybody who's helping make Photo PXL what it is. Lal and Drew were a big part of this at the very beginning. Um, some serious. Kevin. Yes, we are. Yep, some serious drinking, some serious placemat. I saved those placemats, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> where, we, where we came up with it and uh, yeah. we're looking at domains and so forth. So, you know, um, I had a lot of my friends together and we did that and Lal and Drew were part of it. And I uh, thank you guys. It's been a pretty cool adventure so far. We you know, haven't even made it to our first year yet. And we've got a lot of cool stuff happening and a lot of good content. Thank you to YouTube also on that. So anyway, everybody, thanks very much for visiting. And uh, we're trying real hard to enhance your image and your vision. And we'll see you next time.